Well, thanks, Melinda. And uh, pleasure speaking about this topic. I think it's one that's kind of very important for uh, anyone in the livestock industry. <clears throat> I've most of my background is in beef cow calf. So I'm, I'm not as familiar with sheep, goats, or other small ruminants, but uh, of course, most of these principles still apply regardless of the species. It's just a matter of managing them somewhat differently to get to the same objectives. So, so pastures are often abused and it's generally from a lack of management, uh, lack of inputs, uh, and there's really a lot of opportunity to improve their production, both from a plant production standpoint and from an animal or livestock production or maintenance standpoint. One of the first things that you need to consider is never reseed before considering long-term management strategy. Uh, if your pasture looks like the one in the photo here, uh, it doesn't matter what newest grass you plant. If your management is the same, it will look the same as this in a matter of years. And it's generally not worth that investment if you're not gonna change your management. Howard Horton, who planted a lot of range grasses over many years uh, down in Utah, said, if poor management is the need for reseeding, why waste resources to fail again? And that, that's really a critical point to understand. Oftentimes, management is an alternative to reseeding. And I'll explain more about that as we go. One of the first things you can do is limiting the time. And in this case, it's horses. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter, any species. You need to limit the time that they're allowed in that pasture uh, and in case of horses, but even the smaller ruminants, uh, their hoofs do damage. So if there's a lot of traffic, unnecessary traffic, uh, that's affecting soil properties, uh, making it more difficult to irrigate uh, and the water to infiltrate if it's rain fed. And, and the, the plant, grass plant, never has a time to recover. So number one principle, limit the time that the grazing livestock are in that pasture. And there are several alternatives to reseeding. Uh, number one, again, grazing management. It might be that brush or weed control uh, comes along in there. And then kind of the third thing to consider is interseeding. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. For irrigated pastures, certainly you want to consider the soil fertility, plant nutrition. Pastures are a little bit more difficult to, uh, to interpret a soil test report than annual crops. And I, I find that a lot of crop advisors might be very good at recommending fertilizer uh, recommendations for corn or, or uh, even alfalfa, but for pasture, they're, they're used to an annual crop and a perennial crop throws them off a little bit. Uh, so that's, you have to be a little more careful there. The other factor is that animals will, uh, you know, cows don't produce phosphorus, but they sure pile it up at different places. So that's the other consideration. They are concentrating nutrients near shade, water, uh, any social uh, gathering place. So that's one of the big considerations, uh, but that's your opportunity uh, to in, improve your pasture may just be through the proper fertility. And then uh, irrigation management. Uh, again, if, it's, if you're short of water or uh, it's bad quality water or you can't apply it effectively, then uh, steps to correct that would be important. So the foundations of a successful seeding are number one, adequate soil fertility. If you are renovating, uh, reestablishing a pasture, 
then that's your opportunity, especially for nutrients that need to be worked into the soil. For example, phosphorus, that's your time to do it is before you seed uh, is to get that up to acceptable levels. And then you need to select high quality seed. Uh, I'm a firm believer is in that there is no such thing as cheap seed. So if you get a bargain at it, at, uh, uh, I'm not going to name names, but if it's an alphabet farm store and they have the best cheap seed, I would bypass that. Uh, you, you need to know what you want and then you need to buy seed from a reputable dealer and it should be certified. And, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. Need to use adapted grasses and legumes. Several times over the years, I get asked uh, on what I think about somebody planting Bermuda grass in Idaho. And the answer is under no circumstances. Uh, people will see a glossy brochure or hear a story from somebody in the South. Um, and if you can't grow a good cool season grass, then, and you're in one of the Southern states, then you might want to consider Bermuda, Bermuda grass. But there's a reason warm season grasses don't grow here in Idaho natively and it's too cold. So besides the cost and the lower quality of some of these grasses, uh, it, it, it's just not a good thing. And then also legumes. Uh, legumes make a very important part of, of a good pasture, both from a, a uh, animal nutrition standpoint because of the diversity, but also it can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere that can be used by the grasses in a, in a mix. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in having around 40% legumes in a pasture. Needs proper seed bed preparation. You need the correct seeding date, depending on your location and the species. And proper planting depth. This is the one thing that probably has the most wrecks when it comes to successful seedings is depending on the seed size, the species of the plant, getting it at that proper depth is, can be a real challenge, especially if you're limited on equipment. And we'll talk more about equipment to do that. And that goes with that, the correct planting method. There is not, not one implement that does the best job for all species, but there are some that'll do better for most of them. So, and I'll talk more about that. And then another critical factor is proper management of new plantings. You have to t manage those carefully. Uh, and one of the good ways of doing that is just going out, grabbing a handful of the, of the newly seeded grass, pulling up like a cow would do, uh, and if the roots come up when you do that, uh, it's going to do that when they graze it too. Uh, with, with sheep and goats, that would be less of a problem, but they'll still pull up quite a bit. So oftentimes that first harvest of a newly planted seeding, it might be best to make hay out of it, just for that reason. So for species selection, uh, you want to select plant species on the basis of site conditions, what the species can contribute to your objectives. And that should be the first question that a seed salesman or a farm advisor would ask you is, okay, what kind of livestock, what, what, is your, what are your goals and objectives? Um, and then try to fit the best species and then variety to that operation. Uh, each site is unique and conditions change with the seasons and over time. So we, we want to be just aware of that. And we want to select species that will accommodate grazing goals and types of grazing animals. And you want those to plant those forages that will best match your management style. And I think we also want to consider 
the, you know, the, the more we can graze, the more time during the year, the less expensive it will be to maintain that livestock over the winter. Oh, and by the way, I would refer you to a publication that we uh, published in 2010, and that's uh, Pasture and Grazing Management in the Northwest. That is available if you do a search on the uh, University of Idaho. Uh, that should come up. It's Pacific Northwest Bulletin 614. And it has a lot of information that I'm, that I'm getting this from. And there's a whole chapter in this on species selection and uh, grazing management guidelines. So choose the species with regrowth characteristics that will meet your objectives. Th there are some species that work best for hay and not as well for grazing. Uh, an example, smooth brome is, is a very good hay grass. Uh, does not regrow quickly, so it doesn't work as well for uh, intensive grazing purposes. So just an example. And after you select the species, choose a variety that will provide good yield quality and disease resistance. Uh, a lot of times you can choose a good variety that doesn't mean it's available. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, but you should definitely ask some questions and, and try to get to that. And you want to pay particular importance to where that seed was selected and or produced. When uh, perennial ryegrass was first kind of reintroduced to the Western US because it was the best grass in the world, uh, it had a lot of failures. And one of the reasons was that a lot of the seed, so the selection for forage and seed production was all done either in Europe or New Zealand or Australia and very near sea level. Well, with the sea level that mitigated the climate uh, and those are high rainfall areas and any way that those varieties that were selected at low elevation don't particularly do well in Idaho. So again, that, that kind of depends. And, and they've sorted that out mostly. But again, if you buy some cheap seed, it will be a mix and you will get cheap seed. Consult your local extension and NRCS, um, especially for those species not adapted to the site or its intended use because they'll fail. And some of this ties right back to your soils your, and your local soil survey. And your local folks, uh, NRCS has good soil expertise. Uh, you can certainly uh, use their web soil survey site. So that's, that's an important resource there. Some of those old uh, soil surveys are only available in hard copy from your local USDA NRCS office. But a lot of it is on the web now. Well, we'll talk about some different genera and species and mixes. If we have range and dryland pasture, and so this would be areas or species best adapted to areas receiving less than 12 inches of annual precipitation. So we would have Siberian wheatgrass, crested wheatgrass, Russian wild rye, forage kochia. Those are all introduced from Central Asia. And then we have sweet clover. In regions exceeding 15 to 18 inches of annual precipitation, meadow brome uh, should be considered, smooth brome, tall fescue, orchard grass, and then for forbs, you could have small burnet, uh, and for legumes, alfalfa, same coin, sicer milk vetch, and bird's foot trefoil. Doesn't mean they will persist long term because the first drought they could drop out, but that could be considered. If you have wet meadows with high salinity, in other words, a wet meadow would be a water table within three feet of soil surface, then you're best to go with 
one of these varieties or a mix. Tall wheatgrass, uh, I doubt that sheep and goats will eat that very well. Cows don't like it. Uh, but it tolerates that high salinity and, and high wetness. Uh, New High is a hybrid wheatgrass that was developed down at Logan, Utah, and it combines some of the characteristics of rhizomaceous um, uh, meadow grass with, with a wheatgrass. So it, it's a good alternative. We have Altai wild rye, tall fescue again, and, and tall fescue is another species that at certain times of the year, animals will be able to maintain on it. We get into the heat of the summer and uh, tall fescue is not very palatable. Um, and it's very vigorous, very high producing grass. And I argue with plant breeders all the time. They, th their stand, their viewpoint is that if animals don't have a choice, they'll eat it anyway. And I, and I will tell them, yeah, but they won't eat enough to maintain milk production or gain weight. So it's kind of more of a maintenance, uh, pasture species, uh, if you combine a legume with it, then that improves both the intake and the uh, production from it. Um, however, a certain amount of it is very desirable if you want to extend the grazing season and stockpile tall fescue uh, for use in late fall or even winter. It has a very waxy leaf that uh, protects it during weather events in the fall and winter and actually the animals eat it right down to, the, to to a low stubble height in the winter so it has a good purpose in that regard uh, western wheatgrass might be another option and then strawberry clover uh, alfalfa is not listed here because anytime you have a water table within three feet of soil surface alfalfa will it might it might grow well for two years and that third year it hits the water table it doesn't like to have wet feet so to speak and disease will take it if you have a dry and saline site so less than 16 inches a precip and it's saline russian wild rye tall wheat grass or western wheat grass are recommended uh, and you can consider putting slender wheatgrass in the seed mixture as a cover crop species at just a pound per acre. Uh, and, and that's just kind to, of for a temporary status there. But that's knowing that it's not going to persist and stand for more than two or three years. But at a pound per acre, it's not going to limit the establishment of the other grasses so much and it won't be that expensive. So that's recommendation. Well, what about seed mixes? I, I believe in seed mixes, but we do need to keep it somewhat simple. Uh, certainly pastures with multiple plant species often perform better than a mon monoculture. And that's because of plant diversity that offers several advantages. So with legumes, those increase forage quality and add valuable nitrogen to the soil. In fact, if you get up to that 40% legume composition of a mix of the actual plant composition, then you don't have to add fertilizer nitrogen. If you manage, have good grazing management where the, the urine and, and uh, manure is scattered relatively well across the pasture, and with the legumes, you really don't need to add uh, at least nitrogen fertilizer to that. Uh, but that complicates weed control options. But again, if, if you're intensively managing grazing where you're grazing in a short period of time and giving ample rest the, the, and you have a high enough stocking rate, and of course with goats, and sheep, they they like forbs anyway, and they and they're more apt to take the weeds out. So that's it. 
it's not as big a problem as some people think if you have your other management options uh, under good management. Uh, diversity also increases resistance to pests, so that's a good thing. And a mixed seeding can ensure that one or more of the species will establish and survive under various environmental conditions. You know, one year to the next is highly variable in Idaho, and probably the world. And so one year, one species may very well thrive and the next year not, but another take its place. That's the theory and I think it works pretty well. So if you're doing grass legume mixes, I would cons say consider alternate row seeding. So you would put the legume or a forb seed in the small seed box and then you could duct tape every other drop in the large seed box and then you can get this result. It seems to let these lower growing legumes slower to establish um, started very easily. So uh, this happens to be in, in oats and alfalfa, but, it, but the same principle works. Uh, if, if we're talking about seeding rates, we want to talk about pure live seed. Uh, for all, all species we're seeding, uh, very important concept that we consider that because that indicates the number of our, our actual seeding rate we need. So this table comes out of uh, uh, a chapter in that Pacific uh, Pasture and Grazing Management in the Northwest publication that Brian McLean had written. And this is just an example to, to show you how this can be done. So maybe we had these uh, in mind, these three grasses for a mix. So brome, meadow brome grass, orchard grass, and timothy. Uh, and then we've got wheat grasses. So maybe we have some dry rocky hills that either aren't irrigated well or the soil is shallow so for some reason. So we could, we could also have that in part of it. Uh, and so this table just gives you the seeds in the seeds per pound and look at the variation we have there. Meadow brome grass, a very large seed, so there's 101,000 seeds per pound. We compare that to Timothy, there's 1.2 million seeds per pound. So the seeding rate should be quite a bit different between these two. So in the next column, we have at one pound per acre, this is the seeds per square foot, if it were a broadcast situation. So at two pounds per acre, or at one pound per acre, we would have two seeds per square foot for meadow brome grass. For orchard grass, we would have 15, and for timothy, we would have 28. So a big difference between two and 28. So if we were to further convert that where we had a six inch row centered drill, and uh, if we wanted to put 10 pounds per acre of metal brome grass, that would give us 11 seeds per foot in that row, in one row. For uh, orchard grass, four pounds per acre would give us 23 seeds per foot, and four pounds of timothy would give us 57. So that's just an example of, of some of the math we would want to do. And again, in, in this uh, pasture and grazing management in the Northwest publication, this has this more expanded, this the, at both uh, tables and discussion. So again, I highly recommend you get that. It's available. Uh, I forget the price on it. It's relatively cheap. It's 200 pages. Uh, you can look at it on screen. Uh, but it would be, it, it's, it's only like $15 and it might cost five or $7 to ship it. Uh, so, so for a little over $20, you can get a pretty good publication. Okay, so more in the selection of high quality seed. So we want a, the variety that's adapted. And in Idaho, we want adequate winter hardiness. We want resistance to important diseases of the site. And that's going to depend again on your 
uh, local environment, a lot of difference throughout the state. And I get this question a lot, what is the best grass? And <clears throat> one of the people I really respect, John Hudson, who is uh, down in New Zealand for many years, wrote that management is likely to have a greater influence upon herbage and animal production than does the choice of plant genotype. And then uh, Jim Garish is often quoted uh, an old Ozark stockman grass farmer and he says the worst grass you've got is better than the best grass you ain't got. And that's actually a truism. So there is no best grass, but let's look at some characteristics. This is an example uh, analysis tag that should be on any seed lot that you would buy, especially if it's certified seed. And it would have a name here, and, and this is a fictitious name, it gives you the, the genre and species, perennial ryegrass, it gives you the pure seed, 98%. That's really good. Other crop, uh, that's fairly low. Inert matter, fairly low. Weed seed, zero. Noxious weed seed, none found. That is the number one reason to buy certified seed is that you have at least assurance that there's a quality control mechanism here. Doesn't mean that in every case it's absolute but that's the best assurance you can get. So it, we the pure seed is a very important number and the germination percent, in this case, it's 90%. And again, that's good, it depends on the species. Uh, you could also see the origin, almost all grass seed you can buy will be produced in Oregon. And you have the weight uh, and that's a, an ad additive and the date tested and then the lot number. Keep a seed tag, retain a seed tag of each lot of, of seed that you purchase in case there's an issue later. So we want to adjust the actual seeding rate based on pure live seed. Do not assume every seed is viable and capable of producing an established plant. If we had a seed lot with 100% germination and 100% purity, that would have a pure live seed index of 1.0. So one is as good as you can get. Everything else will be a fraction of one. So the rate of the seeding or the actual pounds of bagged seed planted must be adjusted upward for seed lots with a pure live seed index of less than one. And we'll show you, in the, uh, the, here's the formula. And, and again, this is in that Faster and Grazing Management book, and it's available elsewhere on websites. So the step one is you just multiply the germination times the purity. You're dividing it by 10,000 to take the percentage out. That gives you, it puts it in a fraction form. That gives you the pure live seed index. The second step is to divide the pure live seed seeding rate by the pure live seed index, what we just calculated. That will give you the pounds of bagged seed per acre. The next thing we want to do is have a proper seed bed. Uh, in this case, we were, we were seeding some crusted wheat grass and uh, there was a good firm seed bed. Uh, and this was a late November planting uh, the idea was this to be a dormant planting. It was cold enough, hopefully, that this wouldn't germinate until next spring. But it was a good firm seed bed. That's, again, one of the most important things. Um, let's see. So you may want to do fall tillage with spring secondary tillage. In other words, like a disking in the fall. With a, with a rolling to kind of control weeds and firm the soil in the spring. Uh, Pre-irrigate if you can. Again, that's going to settle the soil. Uh, start to get some moisture down in if you, if you haven't had adequate precipitation like this year was for us. And then give it the footprint test. Uh, you walk out there and, it, and if you're 
if, if you sink in more than a quarter of an inch, it's not firm enough. And then you may want to use some herbicide treatment at planting uh, to control, especially cheatgrass or uh, some winter annual that's coming on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Another often uh, question that I get is what about companion crops? Well, a companion crop is something such as oats, uh, and that's used with the new pasture seedings. And the decision whether or not to use a companion crop should be based on soil moisture, <clears throat> availability of irrigation water, and the need for soil erosion or uh, wind erosion and weed control. So there, if you have a very erodible windblown situation where the sand blowing or, or silt will actually cut off the cotyledons as they emerge from a seeding, then having a stubble there is desirable. And it's also some thermal protection for the uh, young plants as they're first coming up. But the thing you have to realize is that companion crops are competitive with the new seedings. They're competitive crops as well. So keep that in mind. So what about the correct seeding date? That really depends on the location, the environment, and the individual year. You can have success or failure in any of the seasons, almost any month of the year, uh, depending on, on conditions. But if you do select the planting time, the spring, the advantage is generally moist soil, spring rain, uh, and you also have on a negative side, cool soils and frost, which was really dominant this spring for us. <clears throat> In the summer, you have the advantage of warm soils, therefore rapid emergence, but you may need seedling irrigation until those get rooted deep enough to withstand a, a short drought. Late summer, August, uh, the advantage is you could probably get a hay crop and a grazing cycle the next year if you put it in in late summer. And it's, I'm really talking about August to maybe through the first of September, depending on your location. Uh, you can seed in the stubble again, a soil and water protection, that will provide adequate time for establishment. If you get too late, uh, the plants will emerge, but they won't be frost hardy and the frost can take them out. There's also dormant seedings. And the idea here is to get the seed out on difficult to uh, access lands, like, like a, a real wet meadow or uh, rough terrain. Uh, so that, that might work for certain purposes. <clears throat> for seeding methods, I, I like to drill, if at all possible, and you need to pay attention to uh, the type of drill it is. Uh, if it's a press wheel drill, you could control depth much better. Uh, if you're just broadcast seeding, Sometimes that's fine for the smaller seeds. Uh, and you can just incorporate that into uh, pastures with a light harrowing uh, and then firm up the seed bed. So if you're in a small, you know, small acreage situation and, and you might have a four wheeler, then you, then you might want to consider getting one of the uh, spinner seeders that just broadcast seeds. And then if you could, a small drag harrow of some kind, uh, that might be the best you can do unless you can find someone else that uh, is willing to go in and plant your small acreage. But accurate seed placement is, is critical. Uh, even a unit planter uh, works real well because it has depth control and, and seed uh, metering. The old rangeland drill, all, you know, they're, they're designed to go over rocks and brush, and so they're designed best for that. They're not, as, as a consequence, they're not as good for depth control. But, you know, again, a, 
various types of situations require various equipment. For general uh, terms for legumes, we're talking about one quarter inch depth from the soil surface. For large seeded grasses, and, and most of the grasses, probably down to a half inch. But if you exceed that half inch planting depth, uh, you get about, for every half inch that you exceed that, you get about a 25% stand reduction. So that's why this equipment and the planting depth is real important. So here we have accurate seed placement. In this case, it's a drill with a depth band. That works real well. The other thing is we have a, a packer wheel in this case, and that controls the depth. And it also firms the soil around the seed, allowing that good seed to soil contact and the moisture to transfer in, into it. So certainly a uh, sod seeding drill, those, those have to be heavier, dutier than the standard grain drill. Uh, and, and you see this one has multiple boxes. So you got a small seed box here. In the, and it actually it's on the back, which is a better placement than one that, that in the front. And so the deeper seed that's in this larger seed box goes down first behind the disc openers and then the uh, smaller seed goes behind and should be shallower. Again, we've got press wheels here that are firming the seed and controlling the depth. And then we also have a coulter that's trying to get cut through the uh, residue that's on the surface. Some seeds like our very small seeds, Timothy, Tef, for example, with a million seeds per pound, broadcast works very well because you just want them just below the seed surface. And then so a broadcast, uh, those are just spinners. And then a very light roller harrowing, the teeth are up on this, uh, will do a good job. Um, if the seed bed is not firm enough, though still, if you have one of these types of drills, then you, you need to look at the seed placement and uh, and you may want the small seed to just be broadcast even with the drill it might be better than being too deep in the furrow. The most reliable seeding equipment that I have used is just a press wheel drill with a small seed box. And in this case, I, the color doesn't matter to me, but uh, this does have that small seed box. In this case, it's on the front. But again, I like it where it's on the back but you can see the tubes there go into the back position. So there's ways of adjusting these too. Um, again, be, just be considerate of the seed size. So if you do have a mix, you probably need a couple of different depths and some very high quality drills might have three or four seed boxes that you could uh, accommodate that with. Uh, for, for a lot of grass seed, for bluegrass uh, or for timothy or alfalfa, these brilliant drills that just use a, a little gandy box that drops the seed down between two rollers. Uh, I've seen excellent stands with these, so another good implement. Okay, so I want to talk for just a minute about interseeding legumes into uh, a pasture. So maybe you have a pasture like this was, a very nice orchard grass pasture, but it was very limited in legumes. There was a little bit of white clover, but uh, so we did a study to look at different treatments to interseed legumes. And so we tried separation treatments uh, and in this photo, we just have a check uh, up here. D nothing was done, and that's a mistake. And then we had mowing to simulate a grazing treatment. And in this case, you would want to graze it just as hard as you could to suppress the regrowth of this orchard grass. So the only time you would really want to abuse it and graze it down as tight as you could. 
And the other treatment was glyphosate or Roundup at one quart per acre. You can see the appearance. It looked like it killed the grass, but it didn't. It definitely suppressed it. Then we used a no-till drill. Uh, in this case, it was a John Deere power tail drill. So this is a uh, power takeoff driven coulter that actually will dig roots out in that seeding path. And then it has the press wheels that uh, kind of firm that back up. <clears throat> so here's a close up picture where we put in our legumes and you can see that we had a decent establishment. Uh, other drills, uh, you know, there, there's a Truax one that, that's a good no-till drill. It has a very aggressive coulter. Great Plains has a good one. Um, here's an old range drill. But some take a little more site preparation. There's a, this old Army half-track truck uh, at an anchor chain around that boulder. So th there can be challenges. Uh, but to kind of summarize, for seeding, choose the species and the varieties that are adapted to the environment. Prepare a fine, firm seed bed. Adjust your seeding rate with that Pure Life Seed Index. You can ask the seed produce the seed provider for this. They should be uh, happy to help you. Uh, but I would always refer back to the Pure Life Seed charts. And again, there is no such thing as cheap seed you should calculate your seed value based on the Pure Life Seed Index. If you do that, what you generally find is cheap seed is not, it's more expensive than buying high quality seed that's a little more expensive per pound. So always do those calculations. Plant certified seed, if at all possible. Uh, just be very aware of bargain brown bag seed or uh, something on the internet. Plant at the proper depth, which is going to be within that range, quarter inch to one half inch. Use the best drill for the conditions you can. For dry land, allow the plants to become established. This means very often two growing seasons on arid lands that you're better off not to graze and then only do it if the plants are well established. So don't even think about grazing it if you're in a drought. And again, use the shortest grazing period possible, especially those first year or two. Um, seedling year management. Go out there and give it the grab test. If you pull up roots, so will the animals. So it may be that you wanna harvest hay if you can and then evaluate grazing that second growth. And you wanna dig some plants, see, see where the roots are, uh, and just evaluate it that way. For grazing management, do not allow continuous stocking. I don't care how big your pasture is or how many livestock you have, you can limit them by electric fencing or just penning them off that paddock during part of the day. Let them out for a day, an hour or two, supplement them as you need to, but restrict their uh, grazing time out there. For most of the grasses, oh yeah, we need 20 to 40 days of recovery between defoliations, depending on the species, the time of year, the grazing cycle. For most grasses, you need to leave at least four inches of stubble. And if you manage your pasture properly, you have livestock that line right up like these cows and whales, and they uh, put their heads down and graze, and uh, the manure and urine is distributed evenly, so you're maintaining your good soil quality, uh, and it works really well. Well, I'll end uh, my talk here and try to answer any questions. Uh, if you think I've gone over the edge, matter of fact, I have before. <laughs>